Hey guys, you know, just a bunch of us hanging out, thinking about the big ideas. Let me hit you with something I've been thinking about. Are you ready? Black lives matter. I mean, not all black lives, obviously, not black cops lives, no, 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 or black lives in the womb. And definitely, most certainly, not the black life of Republican Herman Cain. I don't mean to say that his black life doesn't matter at all. I mean, it mattered a little, or more accurately, his death mattered a little, just enough for the entire media to use it to make the point against the president. It just took a former presidential candidate, Herman Cain. Yes, he supported the president. The president says he was a good friend of his. We wish his family well, and we wish that he rest in peace. And I wish that this president have no peace until he thinks about what he's exposing people to. He didn't even mention that Mr. Cain was at his rally among the maskless masses right before he was diagnosed. Now, maybe he didn't get it there. Sure as hell didn't help. Interesting commentary from a guy who has also had the coronavirus. Were you not taking the appropriate steps, Chris? At least Herman Cain didn't leave his residence during his quarantine and get in fights with passing bikers. If only Herman Cain had thought to treat his illness with a bleach bath and the tiny bottles in the back of his spice cabinet like you, everything would have been fine. It wasn't just douches like Chris Cuomo doing this. Here's Reuters. I mean, as Greg Price notes, Herman Cain grew up in poor, uh, grew up poor in Atlanta, was a rocket scientist for the Department of the Navy, had a story business career, chaired a Federal Reserve Bank, and was the first black Republican to lead a presidential primary and beat stage four cancer. None of that mattered to Reuters. The Reuters article he's referring to ran this headline, Herman Cain, ex-presidential candidate who refused to wear a mask dies after COVID-19 diagnosis. Black lives don't actually matter to the media. They are tools to be used. The same thing applies to COVID-19. Regardless of the truth of the matter, Corona serves as a tool to bash the president and to hype the audience. I might do something more complete on this next week, but here's the thing. I think you know that I'm not someone who's just been blowing off the seriousness of COVID. I I think the whole situation honestly sucks on a million levels. But the media wants you to think we're headed toward an entire nation full of New Yorks. I just don't fundamentally think that's possible. We may have a bunch of individual increases in other cities that add up to scary numbers, but nothing is concentrated and out of control as New York. Let me explain. We kind of have a short memory with this thing. But think back to life uh, back in the day when this thing was hitting New York out of control. It's late February, early March. You get COVID, okay? Your first, you know, you first walk around for a few days with no symptoms and you spread it around. Then you start sneezing, you start coughing, you have a fever, mild symptoms. So what do you do? Well, you live your life completely as normal. You're not social distancing. You're still commuting on the icky train. You're certainly not wearing a mask and you're passing it to people all around you. Now, maybe in this time you've heard a story about Italy or China and the coronavirus, but every night on your TV, people like Bill de Blasio and Nancy Pelosi and Chris Cuomo's brother, Andrew, are telling you to attend festivals in Chinatown and to prove that you're not a racist. So you go check out the festival. You go to a bar, you go to a comedy club. All of those people you have passed it to then spend several days themselves passing it without symptoms until they get them and they still keep going to work and eating out and doing all that stuff. Eventually, when either the symptoms get bad enough or the news gets dire enough, you decide to get a test. But guess what? There are no tests. Keep in mind, at this point, your wife, who probably caught it from you a week ago, has no symptoms. So she basically assumes she's fine and she continues to go out as well. Combine all of this with the fact that your stupid governor starts importing known COVID patients into nursing homes, and that is how you get a New York. Now take the same situation today. You, again, get coronavirus without even knowing. You live life as normal, and you can potentially spread the virus without symptoms again. 
But now normal means social distancing to some degree, no large gatherings, no commute because you're probably working at home, uh, maybe wearing a mask in every store that you have to go into. And then the second you get any sign of symptoms, even if they're mild, you're avoiding everybody. You're probably even sleeping on the couch away from your wife. You know, maybe you got in a fight too, I don't know. And you're going to get tested right away. And the test this time will actually be available. Then as, soon, you know, as you wait the test results, you're avoiding everyone yet again. You're never going out unless you have to. And then if you are going out, you're definitely wearing a mask that time. The result comes in, let's say, positive. When that happens, you're quarantining for a couple of weeks and it's over. But you're also alerting your friend and your brother and your favorite coffee shop that you were in. And then they will go get tested, too. You may have possibly still infected a couple of people early on when you were unaware, but you didn't infect dozens and dozens and dozens, and the chain stops a lot faster. Also, the style of governing, where you intentionally murder all of your old people, as popularized by Andrew Cuomo, has fallen out of style. So you can absolutely get increases in given states, and it can look ugly, but can it get out of control Cuomo style? I don't think it can. Fingers crossed. This is such a tough deal, uh, a tough like deal to kind of process, I guess, at this point. The media is so annoying, constantly warning of the apocalypse that it's natural to want to push back on whatever they're saying. But I'm not sure you've exactly nailed the right understanding of this quite yet. You've probably noticed a change in tone from Donald Trump lately on this issue, at least when, you know, he isn't on Twitter. I want to go through some of what's happening. Uh, let's go back here to the beginning of June. After our initial recovery from March, April, and May, coronavirus cases have started to inch up just a little bit, particularly in states like Arizona, Texas, and Florida. We waited a couple of weeks, and the media kind of said, well, in a couple of weeks, there's going to be lots of deaths. And we waited a couple of weeks, and deaths did not budge. The optimistic take at the time, and this was pretty much everywhere outside the mainstream media, was that this time was different because these cases skewed younger. As we got to July, a bunch of you asked me to look into the stats and see if it was real. And frankly, it's kind of insulting. I mean, you know, it's a Thursday night of a three-day weekend. You think I'm going to sit in front of spreadsheets breaking down the age blend of coronavirus cases in a state I don't even live in? You don't think I have more of a life than that? Anyway, once I had all the data into the spreadsheets, I noticed some interesting things. And I tweeted about it on July 2nd. A lot of people have asked me to take a closer look at the claims of newer cases of COVID-19 hitting younger people. Is this true? And what should we expect as far as mortality rates? Here's what I found. It's true that newer cases are skewing younger using Florida's excellent data. Cases up to June 15th were 47% of them were under 44 years old. After June 15th, it was 66% under 44 years old. Hospitalizations, up to June 15th, it was 17% under 44 years old. After June 15th, it went up from 17 to 26% under 44 years old. Let me take a minute uh, to stop and ask the question that I think everyone's thinking about right now. How are you not following me on Twitter yet? I mean, doesn't this sound great? At Stu Does America, do you understand the incredible content you're missing out on. Doesn't this sound like lots of fun? Continuing, the data seems to support the idea that this research, uh, this recent batch of cases should lead to lower death rates based on the age blend of the group. For those hospitalized on uh, 615 or before, chance of death, 24.5%. For those after 615, it's only 17.3%. It's a pretty big difference. Uh, let me take one more break to show you this tweet. It's from the Lakers game last night. Um, I'm not a social media expert, but why does he want 14 more? How many more? 14. Shouldn't he want zero more police brutalities? I, I don't understand. But here, I just want to make the point, in case you're thinking about following me on Twitter, I didn't want you to think it was nothing but nerdy percentages. I mean, it's mostly nerdy percentages, but not entirely. So back to talking about the younger cases from my uh, July 2nd tweet thread here. Um, lower amounts in June. Taken in isolation, uh, this should be considered good news with some asterisks. Uh, however, it holds true with the same number of cases. That's it. The problem is there are a lot more cases. For each hospitalization, we would expect about a 30% lower chance of death. But there are about 31% more hospitalizations. More people in the hospital, but lower chance of death for each one. Those basically cancel each other out at the average levels from the last week in June. However, if hospitalizations were to increase from that level, deaths, deaths would likely go up overall. Florida has basically exhausted its younger patient advantage, and hospitalizations are increasing. 
The younger patient advantage exhausts itself around 202 new hospitalizations per day. Today's update was 325. I'm not going to tweet the weekend away with disclaimers about all the other possible explanations, of which there are some. I'll just say that if things don't turn around, I worry that we are going to see things get considerably worse in Florida, and I doubt the patterns are different in the other states. I hope I'm wrong, but that's my vibe at the moment. This doesn't mean we should shut the economy down or lock ourselves in COVID shelters until the year 2034. But doing your best to take rational precautions is probably a good idea. This isn't the end of the world, but it's not nothing either. For example, I would avoid almost all situations involving clown cars. Unless, of course, it's related to a left-wing protest, because you're totally cured if you go to a left-wing protest, obviously. So... What has happened since that? That was July 2nd. At the time, July 2nd, the average number of deaths per day in Florida had bounced between 30 and 50 a day for 86 straight days. Really consistent and really flat. This is what the graph looked like up until my uh, July 2nd, you know, nerd fest, I guess is the right term. You see, it's, it's pretty flat going along for a long time. So what has happened since? Since those tweets, the average daily dr- deaths in Florida, unfortunately, have tripled. Now, after 86 days at 50 or below, the current seven-day average is 152 per day, and the single-day total for July 30th was 252, five times the highest average uh, before the beginning of July. Today's update was 257. So what happened? Well, it's true. The cases were hitting younger people uh, than March and April, as I mentioned, and that provided Florida with a younger patient advantage. This meant that the same number of cases would give you less deaths. Even slightly more cases would keep deaths flat, but that only lasts so long. Let's revisit one of those tweets. The younger patient advantage exhausts itself around 202 new hospitalizations per day. Today's update was 325. So here's what the hospitalizations looked like up until that point. You know, you can see it's a slight increase. Sure, they're rising, but they were still under that magic number of 202, which should have kept deaths roughly flat. The problem is not only did Florida go past that number, they blew through it. This is what the hospitalization chart looks like now. Uh, The average per day stands at 481 over seven days, and it's rising. A lot has been made about cases plateauing a little bit in Florida, which is really great news. And hospitalizations will eventually follow. But, man, we still have a good amount of time where we're going to be seeing deaths at these levels and potentially above them. The other thing that happened was that the younger people who were infected passed it to the older people. This kind of seems to keep happening. This is directly from the official Florida report. In mid-June, the median ages of uh, cases, uh, cases came down from the high 30s uh, to as low as 33 years old. That's a big difference in a chart like this. But in late June, it started to climb back up and and hit 40. And then now, as the median cases of of, uh, coronavirus have risen even more, the, the new cases, like, we're over 40 years old now. I mean, hitting as high as 43 on July 26th. This isn't good for hospitalizations or for deaths. Now, here's the time where we stop. And we say yet again, No, I am not saying we are shutting the economy down or we should. We don't all buy panic rooms and storm shelters and hide away from the evil virus until the 2024 election. I know there are psychotic governors out there that want you to never see the sky again. But I'm not them. That ain't me. I do think we should try to take whatever steps we can to not be a corona spreading sneeze machine. You know, if you can do it outside, do it outside. If you can do it at a distance, do it at a distance. If you're inside and you can deal with a mask without passing out like a drunk pledge at a sorority, do that too. Stay away from grandma and grandpa if it's possible, plausible. I don't even know if they like you that much anyway. And keep the large gatherings at a minimum. And if you have to do them, try to do them outside. I know you know all that crap. But I'm not saying it to be your mom. I'm saying it because that's the alternative to your power-hungry governor going Stalin all over your asses. I'm not talking about you, California, because you're already screwed. So just give up. Again, we don't have to be perfect on this stuff. We just need to be smart. And that's how I think the American people are. I don't think the government should be mandating any of this crap. But we've talked a lot about the Swedish model. That's kind of what we're going for here, right? People taking the precautions they deem appropriate voluntarily. My point is, we are fighting for our economy to be open and to give our personal liberty, I don't know, a break. I don't want it to be erased. 
It's okay in that process, though, in addition to our fight for liberty, to admit that, damn, this coronavirus thing sucks. If you want to call it the Wuhan virus to remember how much it sucks, that's A-OK with me. China unleashed this little bastard on the world and we're all paying the price for it, and I hate that. We likely have weeks and weeks ahead of really rough times in Florida. The number one cause of death in Florida is heart disease. It kills 127 people per day. The July 30th COVID report, again, was 252 dead. That's double the previous leading cause of death in Florida. If these numbers don't go down, it will get harder and harder for even good governors to resist doing something. Let's not tempt them. If these numbers do come down, it means lots of good things, not only for the people staying alive, but it means good things for the economy. Sure, you know, the economy may inch along and show some improvement without real improvement in the infection numbers. But the economy won't rage again until this thing feels like it's in the rearview mirror. And if that doesn't happen in the next couple of months, it's going to have a big effect on a certain Tuesday in November, too. Hi, Stu Bergier of Stu Does America here. Thanks so much for watching our video. Did you know you can watch our entire catalog for free right here on our channel? Subscribe now and be sure to hit the thumbs up button on all the episodes you watch because that's how they know you like this stupid show. And that little bell in the corner as well. Make sure you click that. You'll get notifications every time we post new content. Stu Does America every weekday at 8 p.m. Eastern right here.